Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to American Vendicta. So we have on with us today one of our most favorite and most requested guests, Mr. Timothy Alberino. Tim's a good friend of mine. We've known each other for years. He's a hell of a researcher, a ufologist, explorer, um, and he's one of the leading guys in the skill in, in this field up and coming. And I love nothing more than to ask Tim questions, especially about the paranormal, the UFO, the alien stuff, because you know, we really don't ever get the answers that we want. We get canned speeches and we get repeated stuff, but we really don't get the intellectual forethought like someone from Timothy Alberino's type of skill set. So I'm honored to have him on as a guest occasionally, and I know you guys love him. So we are going to be probing his mind like the aliens do some of the bubbas in the backwoods. Tim, thanks for coming on with us. Yeah, well... It's uh, good to be back with you. I don't know how much intellectual foresight you're gonna, or, or uh, what was the word? What was the way you put it? <laughs> we're, uh, we're gonna poke and prod you. I'm gonna yeah, I don't know how. Today. I don't know how much intellect you're gonna get out of my brain today, but we'll see. Nah, we'll get something. All right, let's get let's get right into this. So, pre-show we were talking about topics, and you know we've covered so much when we do these types of conversations. I want to ask you. What is the connection that you can think of between the paranormal experience, the poltergeist experience, the UFOs, the Bigfoot, the orbs, the grays, you know, the portals? Why do all these things seem to come together for certain events at certain locations like Skinwalker Ranch, uh, the Stardust Ranch, uh, a few other of these ranches that are pretty famous? There's a couple of them that are out. In Colorado, along with the cattle mutilations, there's so many things going on there besides just the abductee story. What can you make of that? Well, the plain answer is that I have no idea, but um, I will attempt to articulate some of my thoughts about this. First of all, those are very different scenarios, the ones that you mentioned. You know, all these ranches, the... Skimwalker Ranch, Bradshaw Ranch, Ranch, Stardust Ranch, and all the other ranches that supposedly are, are paranormal hotspots. Um, there's a lot of press around these locations, and they attract a certain kind of people. And so I think that they are a lot more prosaic than people would imagine. I think chances are, if you and I run any of those ranches tonight, we probably would not experience anything. Um, although there is at least on Skimwalker, I don't know about the other ones I mentioned, but at least on Skimwalker, there is a measurable phenomenon taking place on that ranch. Now, the the nature of the phenomenon cannot be known because if we are dealing with, say, gray aliens, then we have to understand first and foremost that human perception is in play and the manipulation of human perception. And so the way that we perceive events is both subjective and subject to manipulation by extraterrestrial forces or extra dimensional or however you want to put it. So um, I think that. There is a whole lot of exaggeration and misconception and misperception when we talk about the mixing of so-called paranormal activity with what we might describe as technologies. For example, the, the Bigfoot incidents in which seemingly paranormal things happen during encounters with Bigfoot. Well, first of all, there may be very simple scientific explanations behind what we think is occurring um i mean this is this is the nature of this is the nature of understanding of increasing one's scientific knowledge of the natural world so people in the middle ages for example used to think that uh diseases were carried in the fog or that 
certain diseases that we know today are caused by bacterias or viruses were were the handiwork of the devil. In other words, that it was a direct result of of demonic activity that people would get sick in certain ways, or a witch's curse, a hex. And we've sort of grown out of that and have come to a much more, as I said, a much more rational scientific understanding. When when we invented the microscope, for example, we were finally able to see into the microbial world and understand that diseases were being spread and propagated by these bacteria, by these tiny, almost inconceivably small creatures that you otherwise could not see. And so suddenly, some of these notions were immediately dis dispensed with, right? Because we, we now have an, an answer, rational answer to something that before seemed supernatural. That's a very rudimentary example, but but I think it applies. So we have that going on. People are seeing perhaps technology that they don't understand or seeing some facet of physics that they have not been able to comprehend and attributing it to the paranormal or the supernatural. But then you also have the propensity of human perception to be manipulated. So human perception is very easy to manip manipulate, very easy. Uh, our brains are subject to, to manipulation every day. I mean, our brains do very strange things. And if you are dealing with a, let's say, a telepathic species, such as the greys, then they're tapped into your psyche on a level that we don't really understand. And so we are at a disadvantage immediately if we are in the presence of a telepathic species because they can read our minds and perhaps control our perception and we can't read theirs and so if the bigfoot creature for example has these capabilities if the gray aliens certainly do then as soon as we're in their presence we can't trust what we see and i think that those two explanations account for much of what we call paranormal and uh, much of of what we would attribute to supernatural activity as it pertains to these cryptids and 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 portals and alien abductions and all this other stuff um i don't venture into the world of the, the traditional fare of the paranormal, which is ghosts and spirits. I don't venture into that world because it, I'll use a phrase I often use, it has the consistency of pudding in your hands. There's nothing you can hold on to. There's nothing solid that you can make sense of. It's all subjective. All of it is subjective. It is not an objective phenomenon that can be measured and as much as these ghost hunters try to do this, many of them are just scamming you with with editing and 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 different kinds of tricks that they use to make it seem like things are happening. Um, but there really is no ob objectable way to investigate the the, the so-called paranormal. So does that mean that I don't believe that you know in spirits or something? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means I know nothing about it and, and can't. And I'm not going to pretend like I do because it's unknowable, really. It's very subjective. It's highly subjective. And so many people will so many people will object immediately and say, yeah, but I had this experience. This happened to me when I was sleeping and then blah, blah, blah. And I saw this in my in my bedroom and I saw this in the woods. Well, well, that's great, but that is a personal, subjective experience. We have no idea what state of mind people are, and we have no idea how suggestible people are, and we have no idea if their perception was being manipulated. Or if they just simply are simply exaggerating mundane events. For example, I once filmed, we, we set up, I was in the desert southwest filming with Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. And we were 
um, we were staying in a in some in a in a hotel, and we set up me and my camera guy at the time. We set up our our camera to take a time lapse of sundown, and then into the night. And we let it run pretty long. Actually, we probably forgot about it, and it ran. It simply ran out of out of batteries overnight. So, I found the time lapse on my computer, and I played it back. And what I saw was quite astounding on the camera. The camera was oriented towards some low mountainous hill structures it's, it's in desert southwest which is very dry and arid and so it was we were taking the time lapse of the of the light you know going down and the sun going down behind the mountains and after the sun went down in the time lapse you saw all of a sudden all of these hundreds seemingly hundreds of or dozens at least i should say maybe not hundreds dozens of lights that were streaking across the camera and they were leaving these long trails of light and they looked very bizarre and my first reaction was oh my god we 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 captured a ufo highway i mean we are in the desert southwest after all where there's a lot of strange activity and it was very exciting at first for me because I thought, what in the world is this? This is amazing. Just these things are zooming all over the place on the screen. And it took me about one hour before I realized that these are airplanes. And that when you take a time lapse of the sky on any given night, if it's clear, you're going to see the same thing. It's a phenomenon that happens when you take a time lapse. Now, had I not double checked and made sure that I wasn't looking at a UFO highway, I might have ran with it, put it in the film, and then looked like a complete idiot afterwards. So, um, uh, what I'm saying is, people see things all the time, and because they have no understanding of what they see, they jump to paranormal and supernatural conclusions because. We are by nature very superstitious human beings. We are by nature very superstitious. And so um, and so I think that that, as I said, very prosaic answer is is going to account for a lot of what people see a lot. And so how do we know about portals? How do we know about Bigfoots? How do we know about all this stuff? Because people talk about it. They have experiences and they come forth and talk about it. Subjective. I'm not discounting subjective experiences. They're fascinating, but you can't draw conclusions from them. Really. You can, you can formulate opinions, but you can't draw definitive conclusions. Now let's pivot to a phenomenon that you can draw definitive conclusions, the abduction phenomenon, because the abduction phenomenon is different. It is not a subjective experience in the sense that it's a one-off. You have this strange experience. Maybe there's somebody else in the world who's had a similar, very similar experience, but but most of the time, these paranormal experiences are, are, are one-offs and, and they're very personal, not abductions. People all over the earth, millions of people experience the exact same thing, or at least generally speaking, the same kind of thing. And it's systematic. It can be correlated. It can be researched. And you can, you can create a body of data. You can make graphs and, and you can come to a rational understanding of a phenomenon that is clearly occurring not in people's minds but physically happening to people all over the world that's the abduction phenomenon and there is a a, a very large body of evidence for the abduction phenomenon and uh, i think we've already gone into that on your show but um and you can go so, into it if, if you want to well i would not ever conflate abductions with the with the so-called paranormal or supernatural 
I would never conflate those two things. Um, because again, one of those things you can research and it has data and you can draw definitive conclusions. The other is wholly subjective. Now, you can make the case that people who experience poltergeist activity often, you know, go through the same things. Um, but a lot of that has to do with how you feel and how you're perceiving the event. Because if you have pots and pans that suddenly fly out of your out of your claw out of your uh, cupboards, um, you're going to be terrified. And any sane person is going to be terrified. And you're going to go through the same emotions. And so there are going to be similarities, obviously. Um, and, but, but you're never going to be able to build a body of evidence that can be correlated and that can be scrutinized um, based on poltergeist activity because it is so subjective, so subjective. In fact, when people experience encounters with ghosts, for example, it's often associated with things that are personal to them, you know, dead family members or something like that, or something, some ancestry of theirs. It's, it's always a very personal thing, whereas an abduction episode is very impersonal. It's systematic. It's a program. Mm -hmm. the, and the thing I see about the abductions is the amount of trauma behind it i i've experienced i i through my past with investigations i've experienced people who have been physically abducted kidnapped i've talked to the victims i've talked to people who uh, are victims of the attempt of kidnapping human trafficking um domestic violent abuse you name it right and i know what a traumatic person dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome looks like and then my question to you is, are we seeing the same type of PTSD amongst the abductees or is the screened um, memory kind of blocking some of that at times? Well, I call it PTASD, post-traumatic abduction syndrome. Uh, because people who are abducted, I think I got that right. <laughs> uh, people who are abducted, uh, often experience the same things. Like for example, and, and it's, it's very comprehensible why they experience these same things. They, they often lose sleep. Abductees often, um, find themselves feeling like they, they did not sleep. Like not that they didn't get good sleep, like they did not sleep. They, they, felt like they they instead were were up all night doing some rigorous activity although they have no recollection of it i mean that's one very simple example and so obviously that lack of sleep accumulates over time and it causes all kinds of problems stress and and uh and low energy levels and it affects your life tremendously that's one one thing um but aside from the the stress and it's and it's and it's a and it's an indefined source for the stress. It's 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 you cannot put your finger on it as an abductee. You kind of have a sense that something weird happened, but abductees are not supposed to remember an abduction event. They're not supposed to remember. There's a block, and there's and there are screen memories. If they try to access their memories, they have to they have to circumvent screen memories, and so. When you see people interviewing abductees on a podcast or something, unless that abductee has already been, let me call it professionally debriefed. And what I mean by that is subjected to um, subjected to hypnotic regression or very simple um, a very, very simple techniques to make sure that they're they're wholly relaxed and that they because when you're in that kind of a scenario when you can get somebody into an extremely relaxed position um they they they're able to recollect things better anybody actually so um and then you and then the person 
has to be has to be interviewed several times, probably, you know, half a dozen times in order to extract, in order to separate fact from fiction, in order to accept separate actual events from confabulation. As if you read the work, for example, of uh, Dr. David Jacobs, you'll you'll find that confabulation is a a real problem. And and people who are experienced and and have become experts simply by the sheer number of people they've worked with and debriefed um, and interviewed, they know how to navigate around the screen memories and they know how to separate confabulation from from actual fact. And it's not a one-off process. It's not just a, you interview somebody who says they're abducted and, you know, and that's it. And then you, and then you extract from that, you begin to build your, your, your understanding of how an abduction unfolds and the things that happen. No, because there's a whole lot of, of junk information in there. Filling in the blanks, for example, an abductee will often fill in the blanks with just sort of things that make sense to them or again, screen memories or whatever. And, and so it, it's, it's not just like sort of a one-off kind of an interview and then, Oh, this is what happens during abductions. No, it's a process. And I don't do it by the way. I don't do that. Uh, I talk to abductees and, and I suppose that I suppose I, I might know how to talk to them and ask them, questions better than somebody who's never studied the material but i am not someone who who would cons- who someone who should be considered uh a an experienced or qualified interviewer of abductees if we're trying to extract um if we're trying to extract hard data I rely on the people who've already done the work, and I don't even know that any more work really needs to be done in that field because we have an understanding. We're not going to learn much. I don't think we're going to learn a whole lot of new information. We, I mean, we would probably get sort of an update on where the program is, how far along it is, how advanced it is at this point, but you're going to get the same kind of information. And so why do I say that? Because number one, when I talk about data related to the abduction phenomenon, I'm not talking about just some average Joe interviewing on a podcast and have an abductee. That's not how you extract the proper data. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. And the second thing is that um, when when properly debriefed, when properly interviewed, that data can be correlated and it becomes it it becomes functional it becomes a body of work that can be researched and so just to highlight this the just to highlight in people's minds the the difference between paranormal stuff and abductions these are in two different worlds i mean um now there may be some similar things that happen some similarities between sleep paralysis for example and alien abduction but that doesn't mean that they're the same phenomenon or have anything to do with each other. Well, let me ask you something as, as someone who's done these investigations and I've collected plenty of witness testimony from victims, arrestees, and also officers, uh, especially after any type of use of force incident. When we were trained how to collect these type of statements, one of the things that we want to know is more or less, I want to put a picture in your mind to recreate in your mind what happened. And I'm more or less going to coach you through it as we talk, right? Walking you through the process because people sometimes get caught up with little things when I want to get a, a full picture first before I get into detail. And the problem with people, you know, I mean, for people who have been in fist fights, shootings, rapes, uh, car wrecks, you know, terrorist events, you have auditory and visual exclusion. So that means there's going to be a point in time where you're going to get tunnel vision and your ears are not going to hear everything except for what you're looking right at. And then we get a little bit deeper into it. And then you hear the dog barking and what this does, this regression talk, all right, uh, especially with officers during shootings is we give you the initial, Hey, what happened? So we can make a report. 
And then we typically give you 72 hours before we talk about the shooting. And then as this is going on, this report can be updated for months because as in courts will show you, there have been time when officers, because it is a traumatic event, even with all the training that you get, you can forget things that you physically see, saw yourself, did yourself, said yourself. Even if we have it on camera, you can tell me that you don't remember it because the brain can block things out. And this is without, you know, the screen memories. So it can take months to get a full idea of what happened in one type of shooting, one type of fist fight. But yet, when I read these things about some of these victims of the abductions, sometimes it's a one-off investigation by a ufologist from MUFON, and then they move on to the next person. I'm like, that's not doing this person justice for such no. a traumatic event. It, it, this, this will take many, many different sessions. Yeah, you have to be interviewed about the same in, if you really want to extract accurate data, you have to interview the person over and over. I mean, you can't just do a one-off. Um, otherwise, you're going to get a very different data set. I mean, you're going to get you're going to get a whole lot of confabulation, and um, and it it takes a a, a a a trained interviewer to work through that stuff. And I'm not saying that, again, I'm, I'm not saying I am one. I, that's not what I do. Um, but I do read the material. And so, and, and I appreciate those kind of researchers, not sure any of them are doing it anymore. Um, you know, the, uh, I always reference the same group of people because I think they're the most competent and unbiased, um, beginning of course with John Mack at Harvard, but you know, Mack, was still convinced even mac was still convinced that we were looking at a psychological phenomenon more than anything he was wrong um, but he had we had a lot of good research and um, then you had carla turner uh and you had bud hopkins and of course david jacobs and and all of them have passed except jacobs and 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 those are sort of the old school abduction researchers and not to say that I agree with everything, all of their conclusions or, or methods or whatever, but it but it is it is good data. It's good data that was collected by competent people using, for the most part, methods that were um, as scientific as they can be. In you know, in a, in a realm like this, so uh, abductions, alien abductions, so. Um, and it's just overwhelming. I mean, the you, the you when you when you look at the data, the conclusion is apparent. This is a physical phenomenon, with as Carla Turner would say, virtual reality scenarios injected into it, in which your perception is hijacked, and you are shown things that you're that they want you to see while they're doing the very routine procedures that ab abductions go through for the most part. So, uh, and this is an interesting point. Let's talk about virtual reality scenarios because I don't ever, hardly ever, perhaps never, hear people talking about what Carla Turner called VR scenarios, virtual reality scenarios. And I think she was very keen for identifying that. And, and you know, one of the only people who who remembers that and appreciate it, pre appreciate it, appreciates it that i've spoken to is, is richard dolan the ufologist richard dolan and a virtual reality scenario is exactly what it sounds like it's a scenario in which you are experiencing a 3d world interacting with things but and you can be standing there in the corner interacting with this world but you know you don't have a headset on like like the technology today, you can be standing in the corner interacting with this world or sitting in your chair and you're completely engrossed in it, but everybody around you just sees you sitting there. Comatose, basically. So in other words, it's happening only in your subjective perception. Hijacking the mind. Hijacking human perception. And, and it's, that's not supernatural. That's not paranormal. That's technological. And so we can do it now with 
but we have to put a headset on your on you know over your eyes and on your head um but we're getting close i mean you know we can imagine a future in which you won't need the headset you'll be interfacing directly through your brain with these virtual reality worlds it's coming very quickly um well, you know, elon ask- musk elon musk made a comment the other day on twitter that it's that it's that they're already in the trial phases uh they're, or they're getting ready to start trials with 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 human subjects uh for the uh for the brain internet interface the, the neuralink so so virtual reality scenarios happen not just in abductions not just during abductions but any time that you are in an environment where entities with this technology are operating, you are subject or may be subject to uh, to the perceptual hijacking, the virtual reality scenarios. And w- so if that's true, then let's assume for a moment that it is, then, then subjective accounts of, of what we think are paranormal activities suddenly become not so reliable, right? So because because we can be shown things rather than actually observing what's happening, we're being shown an alternative reality. We're experiencing an alternative reality. Um, and And this is done, of course, to control you. For example, let's 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 hone in for a moment on Skinwalker Ranch. Um, I, I I recommend everybody read Hunt for the Skinwalker. Great book by Knapp and Keller. Yeah, Keller great, and Knapp. Great book. Uh, it's a fascinating read. Very well written, and of course, it documents the the NIDS research group that was doing scientific investigation on the ranch, funded by Bigelow, and 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 they they found some fascinating things i mean i mean just absolutely fascinating mind blowing things happened on that ranch and this was an investigation done by very uh with very empirical standards and by very rational people and um and still lots of really crazy things happened so it's a fascinating read but a lot of it a lot of the books, so you have the actual investigation, but then you also have the stories that are recounted. And this is, mo- I would say at least, I would say uh, the majority of the weird things that happened happened in this fashion. The recounting of things that happened with the family that lived, that occupied the ranch. And it's a pseudonym in the book. It's not the real name of the family. And this family experienced all kinds of weird things like you know they refer to one as the i believe it's called they call it the immortal wolf i think that's what they call it but the bulletproof this, wolf the bulletproof wolf the, the 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 wolf that would show up to this family would see it massive humongous like horse-sized wolf that mm-hmm. it wouldn't die i mean you 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 can unload a magazine into it and it wouldn't die it wouldn't bleed um, but they also experienced uh, their dogs getting incinerated by orbs. Yeah. Um, they experienced all kinds of things. Uh, they would sh- the, the the wife one day came home and in the grocery store and had all of her grocery bags with all of her groceries, and she she you know put all the groceries, organized all the groceries into the cupboards, walked away, came back, and all the groceries were out of the cupboards. And back in the bag. Back in the bag. So yeah, she she had her she had her hairbrush go missing. Yes, um, all kinds of things like this. And and, yeah. and of course people would say, well, see, that's paranormal. But let's let's just take a different track of thought for a moment. Let's assume that there is an alien base under that property, and not just that property, maybe very, very large. Uh, but part of it is under that property. Let's assume, okay? And these entities do not want people living in the vicinity. They don't want them there. Remember, all of this activity by the Greys 
and whatever other species may be active in uh, our atmosphere and, and on our earth, it's covert. They're not waving flags around and blowing horns and letting us know they're here. They're not communicating with us. They're not. It's all covert. They don't want us to be aware of their presence. They don't want us to know what they're doing or anything about them. And so if there is a base beneath that ranch, then it would make sense that the greys would attempt to drive people away. Now, if they just up and killed them, then that would draw more scrutiny. It would draw more attention. But why kill the dogs? Um, because I'm not sure. It was that was a, that was an encounter with the orbs. Uh, yeah. Maybe the when, dogs tried to jump and grab the orb, and it zapped it. I mean, talk, uh, when you talk about Skinwalker Ranch, we have a plethora of um, of problems. You have the alien creature that scared the hell out of the uh, the New Age guy. Um, you have well, the, so, okay, subjective. We have no idea if that's true or not. Well, once again, it's witness testimony. All right. right. Everything that we get, to include even the abductees, is witness testimony. You say subjective, and I'll come to you from a law enforcement perspective. I take every witness testimony. Doesn't matter. Well, it's subjective, but but not just subjective. Subjective in the presence of alien technology. But there That's was what I'm trying to say. There was there was so many technological problems on that ranch. With yes. surveillance. I, I mean, yeah. and things that don't make sense. And we're not talking about uncredible guys. You know, we're talking well, that's about what I'm saying. It's, it's, in front of their name. Well, it would all make sense. I mean, I'm sure it all would make sense in the context of a base under that property. And, and the aliens are trying to do exactly what they do with the abductees, by the way. They're trying to mask their presence. They're trying to see people say, for example, this was very common early on um, when 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 Christians began to become uh, when evangelical Christians began to take an interest in the in the UFO phenomenon. It was very common to say and still is today that demons are masquerading as aliens. But. After I read enough materials about abductions and, and the phenomenon in general, I, I drew I drew the opposite conclusion. It is my contention that aliens are masquerading as demons. In other words, uh, a lot of this poltergeist activity that happens to abductees and, and, and perhaps in the vicinity of these bases and places they don't want you to be, they being the greys, or whoever, uh, they are going to employ their their technological capabilities to affect your perception and your psyche and to drive you away or to cause you to draw other conclusions about the things that are happening. They will do things, I would, in that scenario, to that are completely nonsensical, to throw you off the trail of a systematic technological or i should rather say a rational technological explanation throw you off of that trail that's the one they don't want you to draw and so you can imagine all kinds of things happening and actually what's interesting is i had a conversation with the late kevin burns before he died like in 2020 um or I believe he died in 2020. Kevin Burns was the president of Prometheus Entertainment. Prometheus Entertainment is the company that produces uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, the mystery of Skinwalker Ranch, the TV show that I think is still running. Maybe it's over. I'm not sure. Um, and also Ancient Aliens and Oak Island and, and, a, and a, a catalog of other TV shows. And Kevin was very good at his job. He was a phenomenal producer extremely creative guy and i and and he was an acqu acquaintance of mine we were friends and kevin called me one day out of the blue 
and we were discussing a handful of things, different projects that that we we were considering maybe doing together and television uh, projects. But also, we we started to talk about Skinwalker Ranch because obviously Kevin's uh, film production crew was out there filming the show. And he didn't know that I was interested in Skinwalker Ranch. In fact, he wanted to put me on the ranch and, and on the program. Um, but what's what I find interesting is he asked me what I thought about it. What my opinion of Skinwalker Ranch was. And I said exactly what I just told you. I believe that there's a base, as crazy as it sounds, there's an alien base under that ranch. And they are messing with the human psyche and human perception to throw people off the trail of a technological explanation and to drive people away from the residents who live there, to drive them away from the property. And and his reaction to that was, that is exactly what I think is happening based on their own investigations and based on what he knew about the ranch, having studied it and, and for, for the for the production they were filming and having his crew, having experienced some things too. He drew the very same conclusion and was very intrigued that I thought that I thought that as well. And, and the reason I bring that up is because I was, I was actually very close to going on the ranch. It fell through and, 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 and sadly he died shortly thereafter within a couple of months of that conversation. So, um, I, I believe that a lot of the experiences that happen on that ranch happen for a reason. Not they're not random, although they appear to be completely out of the blue, nuts, you know, crazy random occurrences. They're not. There's a purpose for much of it. There's a purpose for it. What's the purpose for the hitchhiker? Um, refresh my mind on the hitchhiker. So there's been a lot of counts of visitors to the ranch, um, you know, for little things, just delivering stuff at times. And then there have been uh, special guests who have come and then certain investigative uh, groups have come out there. And when they left to like, let's say, go back to their hotel. Oh, okay. Yeah. If the phenomenon the follows them. Yeah, the phenomenon follows them. It follows them. Yeah. Uh, what do you make sense of that? Um, maybe this, this scare the living daylights out of them. So they stop investigating, stay away. I don't know. Um, is it possible that there's some kind of demonic activity involved in this as well? Sure. It's possible. I don't discount that. Um, that's also possible, but there again, who knows what's going on? I mean, who knows, who knows if you're talking about technology that we already know because of the abduction phenomenon virtual reality scenarios and technology that that is meant to screw with your perception then anything is possible well let me ask you and, and it's not to say that the grays by the way understand what we're doing i i don't think that gray aliens understand television production crews i don't think they even understand you know what we're trying to do when we're putting drones up in the air and when we're dragging these rudimentary you know gpr units over the ground i don't think they know what the heck we're doing I, I, there's no reason for me to believe that they understand why we do the things we do you think they take it as a threat i just think they're trying to throw us off the trail and keep us away i mean do they know what that, that history channel that there's a thing called the history channel and they're filming a television show on that ranch i very highly doubt it because these beings, they don't think like human beings. We're completely, th these things are foreign to them. But what, if, what about the hybrids then? Wouldn't a hybrid have given them the intelligence that? No, hey, right no the hybrids you? would know, would, 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 I mean, unless the hybrids were, unless somebody took the time to explain to a hybrid, for example, hey, we're filming a television show. What's a television show? Oh, it's a show that, you know, you can watch on your TV. What's a TV? I mean... Right. It's this thing that you can see people, you know, they're actors and they're doing a, well, what's an actor? So it's wrong to think. It's, of it's, a, they it's don't nothing. To, it's wrong to think of a hybrid as you and me and our Completely. form of, of intelligence. No, they're like a two-year-old kid in terms yeah. of their understanding of what's going on around them. They know nothing. They know nothing 
about human society, the way we think, why we think the way we think. They don't know anything about our history unless they're taught by abductees. They only know what they're taught. And that's why they're being taught. And so um, I don't think we can look at a phenomenon like that if it is an alien phenomenon. And, and, and we should not look at it and assume that they know what we're doing. They don't know what we're doing. They don't know. They don't necessarily even know that a human, that a human, that the, that the human beings inhabiting that property own it, like have a deed. Why would they know that? Why would they even care to know that? Number one, but why would they know that? They don't, why would they understand our economy or the way that we perceive property? They would just look at it, look at it as these people are too close for comfort. Let me ask you. We need to drive them away. Let me ask you a few questions. All right. For one thing, you talk about technology and we talk about the poltergeist activity where you turn around, you put something up, you turn back around and it's all out of place. When we talked about the cattle mutilation scenario that happened here on our homestead, um, your explanation is that they have the ability to bend time to their will. Well, through through this is a hypothesis that you gave me. Well, I mean, not exactly that. Um, there, I believe. Let me preface this by saying that I believe that. Bob Lazar told the truth back in the 90s that yeah. he was a part of the exper- uh, that he was a part of the program at Groon Lake and that he was working on he was assigned to work on the matter antimatter reactor he explains it in great detail exhaustively in a very old video um that you can still find hard to find but you can still find it where he drives out into the desert in his Corvette or whatever it is and gets out and gives this kind of a cheesy video, but he gives this very scientific and and uh, comprehensible explanation of how the antimatter reactors work. And he and one of the things that he says that is that the craft generate gravity waves and they create distortions in space time around the craft when they're powered up because they use a matter antimatter reactor to generate tremendous amounts of energy antimatter the matter antimatter matter reaction is one of the most powerful forces in the universe um and antimatter is obviously not science fiction we can we can isolate it at cern and do but but it's unstable and we can't it's not it's impermanent at least that's what they say you know, I mean, the, the wet dream of the Chinese Communist Party would be to to create an anti an antimatter bomb, but that's a whole nother story. Um, so when you charge up this technology and the craft is generating these gravity waves, it's distorting space time around it. Now, when you distort the fabric. When you distort the fabric of of space, you are also then affecting time because they're connected inextricably. So if if so, these craft are generating gravity waves, distorting space time. They're kind of in a bubble, their own gravity bubble, their own space time bubble. Now, that's not to say that they're ten years ahead of us or something like that. No, I think that it's a it's a it's a a very small distortion. In other words, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes difference inside of that space-time distortion bubble. And so maybe two minutes different. Who knows? And so where where whereas you might have been standing next to your cow, walked away for five minutes and came back and the cow was suddenly dead with no blood in its body and you know it's anus cord out or something like that which is very common um you may you may think i was just here it was it's only been 5 minutes but that may not have been the actual reality when that saucer hovered over that cow and it was it's within it's a different it was in a it was in a space time distortion bubble so what 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 seemed like 5 minutes to you may have been 10 inside of that distortion is what I was saying. And so, and I don't know, I'm not a physicist. I don't know exactly 
what uh, the the differ the differential would be there. The, the but the difference between being inside of that gravity distortion bubble and outside of it. But there would be some difference. I know enough to know that there would be some difference. And so the grays can project that technology outside of the craft. I don't know. And, and I don't, I don't know. And I don't see why they would, um, that technology is primarily, that's the propulsion system of the craft. They don't do it in order to change time. I don't think, I think it's just the propulsion system of the craft. The craft is moving in a gravity bubble. It's moving in its own atmosphere, really. And Lazar explains it as it's it's really tumbling forward. It's falling forward um, rather than flying. And, and, and it's really a, a very clear and I think extremely well articulated explanation, Lazar's. It makes perfect sense to me. The little I know about physics, and I have studied this to some degree so that I can try and wrap my head around it um, as a lay person. But... So, so the point is that when you have technology like this in play, uh, just like my example with the microscope earlier, if you if we if we can understand that the matter antimatter reaction is is creating enough energy to distort to create to produce a, a, to generate gravity waves which distort space time around the craft, then we can answer a lot of questions. We can answer the question of how it is that, you know, five minutes ago you were you were standing there looking at your cow. You walked away, and then suddenly the cow is in the condition I just described because more time elapsed uh, than you think. And also couple that with the technology that's being employed. I mean, may, they might be able to <laughs> they might be able to you know drain the blood and and core out the anuses of those cows like we what like we you know. Like we process whatever, like we process carrots or something. Well, you know? that's that is that that is something that the NIDS research team monitored, surveyed, and took many different samples of and investigated deeply on that ranch. And I never cared one bit. It was a cool story. My wife and I were listening to the book on Audible. Uh, I think I'm like 200 books deep in Audible now. So um, that was my first Audible book, actually, was that book. And, you know, we're we're sitting here thinking to ourselves all night, man, wouldn't that be weird if that happened here? The next day it happened. Mm. Now, as as someone who, you know, I spent 15 years in the government, I know some people are going to say, ah, you know, I'm, I'm all these different types of things because I work for the government. But in my realm of law enforcement, if you get caught lying, you get giglioed and you get fired. So if you are going to make any type of um, substantial claim, paranormal, whatever, I mean, man, you're going to get you're going to get put in a box at work and you're going to get the shittiest jobs possible. And you don't want to be that guy. Right. You don't you don't express your problems at work, uh, and I and I I was I was so taken aback. I had to ask guys at work, so how do you explain this? I I'm a very rational person. What I see is what it is. Um, I try to explain most things away, and sometimes I feel like I can. And there is sometimes when I'm like, this is completely out of my element, and I need to reach out to somebody else. I had an entire carcass evaluation done. Even the doctor who did it said, I have no idea except, and I just told him that's an unacceptable answer. And oh, well, I mean, what like I, I got said, was it, it, it's a, it, it is a, this is not a common occurrence. And there was a point in time when this was a common occurrence and, and he pointed to Skinwalker Ranch. Well, yeah, I mean a lot more. I mean the San Luis Valley of Colorado; it's still happening, and 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 uh, I think to a great extent. So, and in other places, of course. And uh, the, the government really sort of harassed the the farmers who were the the cattlemen who were reporting it, and so they probably just quit reporting it. Like, what's the what's the point? They can't stop it. The government can't do anything about it. They call us crazy or whatever. They disbelieve us. So, what's the point? So, I think people just don't even report it anymore. 
Um, but I, I assure you, it's still happening. And I would guess probably to the sa- same scale or perhaps even more so than it was before. Um, but the, so so when when you have advanced technology that is inconceivable to us, then uh, and let's be specific again. Let's return to the to the matter antimatter reaction inside of the craft inside of the reactor that produces enough a tremendous amount of energy that would be required to generate gravity waves um which which bends space time well there's other things other that answers other questions regarding uh, associated with the ufo phenomenon that people oftentimes regard as supernatural or paranormal for example the fact that you that these craft disappear well uh, lazar uh, wrote about in, in in his book and has talked about in interviews that when the craft is fully energized, it you cannot see it anymore. It's still there. It's still physically there, but because it's distorting space time around it, it it becomes virtually invisible. You can't see it from certain perspectives, at least like from below. You can't see it anymore. Not because it it went into a different dimension. Not because it's a supernatural phenomenon, but because it's distorting space time, it's fully energized and it's it's literally bending space time and therefore light around it, and you can't see it. And so that's a very again, as I keep using this term because it's the one that comes to mind. It's a very prosaic, very interesting, very scientific, but a very prosaic explanation for something that people think is spooky is supernatural is paranormal when in reality it's just technology what it's just physics what do you think about the times when the military will catch a uh triangular like object that you cannot see with the eyes but they can pick up on thermal and night vision it would be the same kind of thing it would be some sort of technology that is making it rendering it invisible in certain spectrums um and now I'm not saying that paranormal around. things I want to I want to reiterate this. I'm not saying that paranormal things don't happen, that unexplainable things no matter you know what kind of an understanding you have of physics do not occur. I'm I I absolutely think those kinds of things occur and I've experienced things in my life again subjective things in my life that that make me scratch my head. I mean, uh sure, and I don't have any explanation for those. I'm just trying to point out that many, many of our ideas and notions about supernatural and paranormal occurrences are matters of perspective and perception and manipulation and 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 all kinds of different, very mundane reasons. And so, um, and, and the reason why I brought that up is because you're talking about these ranches. And so, the orbs, okay, let's talk about orbs for a second. People post all the time, they, they print it in books and they post it online, those pictures where you take a picture of somebody at nighttime, usually, or in low light environment, and you have all these orbs floating around them like bubbles. And people say, look at the orbs. Well, that phenomenon is easily reproducible. You can reproduce it. In fact, when I was in Sardinia years ago, making a film about giants and doing an investigation into the giants of Sardinia, I was with an individual who was a very superstitious fellow. I mean, very superstitious. And he claimed all kinds of weird things that he was, you know, in mentally communicating with the giants and that he would see spaceships all the time flying around saucers and which that isn't difficult for me to believe. But but he made all these claims and I and I discerned that he was a very superstitious person. And he said that people who come to his yard always take pictures and, you know, a lot of them get pictures of the orbs and their spirits or their fairies or something. And they they like to live in his garden. And so, of course, the skeptical person I am, me and, and my cameraman at the time was 
way more skeptical than I was about all this stuff, kind of rolling his eyes even about the notion of giants. So we decided to see if we could replicate the phenomenon. And we did on our very first try. And we replicated it because if you take a picture, and I don't remember all the technical details here, but if you take a picture with a camera in a certain way, you're going to get reflections off of dust and particles and or raindrops or what have you. And the conditions were such that night that we knew we could replicate those, you know, those so-called orbs um, by taking this picture in a certain way. So we took a picture without doing it in the way that we knew would replicate the phenomenon and nothing showed up. And then we did it in the way that we knew. And I, again, I can't remember what it was right now. I believe, and I believe sure the, enough, I believe the sure enough, all those orbs showed up. And you know what? All those orbs showed up, quote unquote orbs. They weren't, they weren't orbs. It was just a, it was just a, it's a photographic phenomenon that happens under certain conditions. And I showed the picture to my friend and my Sardinian friend, my Italian friend. And, and I told him that we replicated the phenomena because here's what we did. And we did a X, Y, and Z. And so we were able to reproduce it. It's not spirits. It's he just, no, it is spirits. They're spirits. Those are orbs. They like to be in my garden and people come and they can feel their presence and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, um, once you start thinking in a certain way, you can get caught in a feedback loop. You know what I mean? You can get caught in a feedback loop and you have to be really careful. For example, there's a picture that goes around. Now, I'm the guy who talked. Okay, hold on. I'm the guy over here talking about aliens and giants and all this other stuff and Bigfoot. Okay, so I'm not some some skeptic society. Uh, but you're not a sensationalist. Well, yeah, I mean, I just I just like to think of myself as a rational thinker to the extent that I can be. But I hold a lot of opinions and thoughts that people would think is absolutely nuts. OK, so I'm that guy. But but there's a picture that's been circulating for, I don't know, six, seven years on, on the Internet. And it just doesn't die. It just goes and goes and goes and goes. And it's just every couple of months. I know it's going to come across. One of my social media accounts or somebody's going to show it to me on their phone and it just doesn't stop. And it's, it's a me, I don't, it's not a meme. It's a, it's a photo with a caption and it's a photo of these, these terraced, these little terraced walls and they're, they're, they're terracing walls and they're at Ojante Tambo, but, but the photo doesn't reveal that. It just shows these big terraced walls I say little, I mean, they're not super big terrace walls or, I don't know, they're, they're maybe 10 feet tall, each one, you know, it's like a 10 foot wall and then a, and then a, uh, a plateau and then a 10 foot wall, another plateau. So they look like steps, right? But they're big. So you got people walking around them because it's an archeological site and the people are like, you know, they look small. And so the caption is, who were these steps made for? And if you're in stuck in a feedback loop, and that feedback loop is like a supernatural, paranormal, Nephilim feedback loop. Everything, you it's like you have this monocle on your eyeball. And everything you look at, you look at through that particular lens. And if you're really, and if you're really obsessed with a, one particular topic, then that becomes the focus of that lens. And so if you are obsessed with uh, giants, everything you see has to be associated with giants, some way, shape, or form, like my friend in Sardinia. Everything had to do with giants to him. Everything. And, and so that's like a feedback loop. So you, so that I get picture... Same, I get the same problem with people in conspiracy theories. Well, yeah, of course. So that picture... Who's who were these steps made for? It's supposed to it's supposed to uh, um, indicate that these steps were made by and for giants because it couldn't possibly obviously be made for regular sized people. Right. And it just keeps going and going and going and going and doesn't stop. But the answer, the correct understanding of what you're looking at, that of that picture is very boring. It's very mundane. It's not sensational. Those are agricultural terraces at Ojantaytambo. 
100% for sure. I've been there like eight times. Those are agricultural terraces. And in and of themselves, actually, they are quite fascinating because the Inca were experimenting. They were like uh, doing scientific experiments with crossing certain breeds and trying to be able to grow corn at different elevations. And they were absolutely ingenious. I mean, it really is what they were able to do, the Inca with the, with terraces. I, I mean, I could talk for an hour on that. It's just absolutely amazing. But it's not going to be interesting to somebody who just wants to see giants everywhere. Because it has nothing to do with giants. They're not steps. They're terraces. So you think Full because stop. you think because of this problem that people easily explain away a scenario or an event that happens when we should be saying this has a technological uh, backing to it, not supernatural. Stop thinking in this realm. Or we don't know what it is rather than defaulting to a supernatural explanation for something or a paranormal explanation. Just a big question mark. I'm fine with question marks. I don't know what it is. It could be very, very simple answer. It could be an answer that has to do with physics that maybe we don't comprehend yet or whatever. But the point is that this happens to people all the time and it's increasing. It's increasing. And, and, and that's not a rational way to view the world. It, it, a good researcher, a good investigator, and I'm trying to be one, to become one, to learn, okay? Because I've made lots of mistakes myself and I've fallen prey to all of this myself. So I've learned by experience. So a good researcher will not view the world through any kind of a lens whatsoever. You may be interested in a certain topic and you're going to such and such and such a place to research a certain topic. But if you're a good researcher, you're not going to expect to find anything. You're going to go and see what is there. And you're going to allow whatever you find to interpret itself That's based right. on a set of data or a set of facts. And if there are none, then it's a big question mark. Or you may find evidence of what you were looking for. And that's great. That's the best case scenario. So people do this all the time. The most, I think, the, the best example nowadays is flat earth theory. People who are absolutely convinced that the earth is flat see everything through that flat earth lens. So every single conspiracy, everything that happens with the moon or Mars or whatever, everything has to has to be viewed, must be viewed through the flat earth lens. Hey, hold on. Stop right there. Because now the comment section is going to explode on your channel and on my channel. So if we're going to go this direction, let's go this direction. But I have a question for you. For one thing, the 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 film, the photos you were talking about, I think what the little dots that you're seeing, we call those artifacts. Artifacts, that's right. Okay, so photographic artifacts. So the other thing is right here, I have one of the first prints of the moon. My mom gave me that a long, long time ago. Um, and I've always wanted to be an astronaut. Of course, they kind of have weight standards, and 300 pound astronauts typically not favorable but here's my question for you did we go to the moon was there something there and why aren't we back well of course i can't possibly know definitively the answer to that question but it is my opinion that we did go to the moon my very strong opinion i'm quite convinced that we did but that we did not see what the astronauts saw. We were not shown what was discovered there. And we were not the first to go there. And I believe we, when we went there, we found artifacts. We found evidence of perhaps prior habitation or visitation on the moon. I think that they were being watched by saucers observed while they were up there santa claus and, that's that's one of the uh, exactly right and no. and that there are structures all over the moon and i think that at this point i think that you believe in pretty, the that's pretty definitive that you there believe are structures in the crystalline the structures the towers i think the that there are uh, structure ruined both ruined structures structures as in like buildings right and 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 some that are in use presently in use and I think there is a lot of evidence for that. And that's a, that's a rabbit hole. But there's, I think, I really do. I think there's a lot of evidence for that. So we went, but the guys that went were not 
those astronauts were were they they made the greatest discovery in, in human history and they were they had to lie about it so one of the and, things and and, they, and it for so was there fakery there were was. there videos that there were was. manufactured yes they're never going to show you what they really found and it makes perfect sense that we never went back why because do you think that the government do you think that the US military is going to allow NASA to go back after that kind of a discovery no way the moon becomes exploration of the moon becomes the purview the sole purview of the US military at that point and and that's it it's 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 very simple uh, it, the, the fines were too important to the military and they were never going to tell us. So, so what stops so, China from going there and finding it? it? Nobody. And, and nobody at this point. So, uh, and they are going, they know, I, I, I think they, they're perfectly aware of some of the things that are on the moon at this point. And in fact, people now have access in the commercial world to extremely powerful telescopes that lay people can get and and you can follow some of these people on twitter on on instagram these are amateur uh astronomers and they don't have an agenda they're not you know pushing some kind of an agenda they're just they're just astronomy nerds and they love taking pictures and they're beautiful amazing pictures these people get extremely high resolution it's not easy to get them but but uh they get these absolutely incredible pictures of the moon and of mars listen i had a uh, and i know this is a, a, a rabbit trail from where we where we were a digression but i had a my neighbor is, yeah, is go down the, the my neighbor is the uh he works at the university here in Bozeman. He works at the, the University of Montana or Montana State. I was confused the two. Um, but he he works at the university here in Montana and uh, in Bozeman, I should say. And he is like the guy that sets up their experiments. So he gets all the new toys when they come in. He's got to put them together and he's got to sort of operate them for the professors and and, and help set up the experiments. And so... He was given a high-powered telescope, and he was—he had to set it up. So he's dial, dialing it in, and this was wasn't that long. It was a few months ago. He's dialing his telescope in, and he and he knocked on my door, and he said, "Hey, I got this really awesome, expensive telescope I get to play with tonight. You want to come look? You want to? I've got it dialed on. I've got it dialed into uh, uh, Mars right now. You want to come see Mars? He's like, you want you want because you know he's been friendly with my kids and." And you, you want your boys to come take a look at Mars? And I was like, absolutely. We all ran out there, and me and me and all my boys ran out there, and uh, we looked in this telescope. And man, I'm telling you, it was just amazing how clear you could see Mars. I mean, it looks. And by the way, it looks exactly like the NASA pictures of Mars, exactly, and. And we were looking at Mars, and um, I mean, it was super clear. It was really remarkable. Um, and I looked at it, and my kids looked at it, and then we then he he turned it and, and he oriented it towards. Um, God, I don't want to get it wrong. I, I, it wasn't Saturn, although we were looking at Saturn. But it was. Uh, um, I want to say that it was Jupiter. I think it was Jupiter. What's the one with the big swirl? The red eye, Jupiter. Jupiter. Yeah, that one. Okay, so we've all seen the NASA pictures, and everybody's like, oh, those are fake. NASA pictures are fake. They just CGI it, right? We all see that big swirl on 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 uh, Jupiter. And I always thought, why is it just always there? You know? Like, what's the deal? It doesn't, uh, maybe it does move, but it's always there. Sure enough, I look through this telescope, boom. There it is. Just like the NASA pictures, crystal clear. And I'm not talking about like sometimes you look in a crappy telescope and it just looks like a bright light in the sky, maybe a little bit of definition. No, this is like looking at a high resolution photograph looking through this telescope for the university. And I'm looking at Jupiter and I'm like, wow, it's exactly the way 
that I've seen in the pictures. And why shouldn't it be? But there, there that huge swirl going across the middle. And I saw three moons, or at least a couple of, of the moons. I could see them in the telescope. And they move and they change position. If you wait, you know, a period of time, you look again, they change position. So this planet has moons orbiting around it. Just like we're told it does. And I'm not looking at a photo. This isn't CGI. This is a freaking telescope, a university level telescope. Um, very expensive. And that was really cool. I mean, it was really awesome. I can see why people get addicted to that. Uh, it, it's just so mind blowing because when you look at it with the naked eye, when you look at Mars, for example, the naked eye, when we were looking at it, um, not through the telescope, just looking up in the sky, it just looked like a bright dot, like a really bright ball of light like mars looks like you know a little bigger than a star but as soon as you, you as soon as you put your eye on the viewer boom it's that red planet just like you see it on the pictures so it's really astounding and uh and and that's i guess that's another example of how you know as we as we increase our technology some of these things that seem for so many centuries that seemed like mystical um you know, when we can see it in high resolution and, and it, it, it sort of demystifies, it demystifies it, but it doesn't make it any less fascinating to me. So all the way back around now to those steps at Ojantai Tamba, which are not steps, but terraces. So people get stuck in these feedback loops and everybody does. I have, I'm not taking shots. I'm not taking shots at flat earthers or anybody. Everybody gets stuck in a feedback loop. So if you're obsessed with Bigfoot, you know, everything, you're looking through that lens, that cryptid lens. And if you're obsessed with giants, everything is going to, in your mind, is going to be associated with Nephilim or whatever. And, you know, people tend to do this. I try as best as I can, and I know that you do too, to disassociate when we're doing research investigation, disassociate any kind of preconditions that we have presuppositions about a topic try and disconnect it from what we're looking at and just try and try and distill an understanding of a phenomenon based on what we can know about it right and that and, and it's okay to have preconceptions and and pet theories and stuff that's perfectly fine everybody has them i'm just saying that don't get stuck in the feedback loop don't get stuck in the feedback loop. If your feedback loop is supernatural, everything is supernatural, then you're going to look at the abduction phenomenon and say, oh, that's just supernatural because that's what you're used to. That's your default. Well, and I would encourage people to, to stop doing that because that's not how you enlighten yourself or become enlightened to, in, to new information. You're, going to, you're just going to always uh, stay in the same place. And you're never really going to advance based on rational arguments or data. And there's too many people stuck in all these little loops, man. And, and then when you hear people, you know, sometimes you'll hear somebody on the radio or something who are talking about, people tend to do the following. People tend to take all of the most fascinating topics in, for example, in this community that we're in, all the most fascinating topics the Nazis, for example, aliens, fallen angels, Nephilim, Antarctica. What am I missing here? Bigfoot, right? And squish them all together. Just compress them together and force them to be related to each other. Yep. People do that all the time. And, and then and they come out with this weird jumbled nonsensical irrational theory because they're forcing these things to be associated are they associated maybe but but people just they have to make these direct connections now there's always going to be subtle connections of course you make subtle connections and there may be direct connections um and so, and, and a lot of times you can find like for example nazis in the occult that's a no brainer that's a no-brainer, right? But Nazis and Nephilim, hmm, <laughs> that's a stretch. That's a stretch. I mean, I, I guess you can bridge that gap somehow. 
The problem, but, the problem is when people bridge these gaps is you're taking away from what actually happened and you're adding to, and now you're creating lore instead of facts. See, the thing is in investigations, we're fact finding. Okay. Unlike, you know, that's what right. the, yeah. unlike what the that's FBI right. does with, you know, the whole Russia scandal, uh, in actual investigations where fact finding were being objectively reasonable, uh, nonpartisan, you know, we're, we're, you got to understand something, you know, and this is the way that I approach doing these podcasts. I did a nine part Nazi series and I did it in the way that I want to find out everything about these limited subjects that I gave myself. I have these topics. I want to find everything out about these topics. And I didn't stop until I found everything that I possibly could. Good, bad, confusing, indifferent. It didn't matter. You make the decision of what you think it is. See, when you, the way ufologists should present themselves and the problem with ufology is ufology has turned themselves into kooks. They've turned themselves into a big clown show. Most of them are, you know, are extremely intelligent. They're out in the field. They're doing the real research. And then you have a few guys who are complete jackasses who ruin it for everybody. And, you know, when you when you try to really bring forth the meat of the subject and people go, oh, this guy's talking about aliens, so switch the tube, um, you know, it really hurts the investigator's credibility because you get tied to other people. You know, and well, yeah, I mean, you know, that that there's there, the modern modern ufology is not what it used to be. You know, you had guys like Jalen Hynek and and uh, a lot of these old school researchers who who were very, very objective, Jacques Vallée, for example, and who were coming at this from a rational approach and this is the way that ufology was in the beginning. It was a very, it was, it was people who were really interested in, in seeing if they could find evidence, investigate the phenomenon and find evidence of what it might be, or at least indications of what, of what it might be. And then you had an injection, probably in the nineties and early two thousands, you had an injection of new age philosophy it was injected into ufology and then it just went nuts it just went nuts and uh today you have what's very interesting i find i follow ufo twitter and it it kind of turns my stomach because it's for one thing it's very liberal there's a political there's a a political zeitgeist to it a political um atmosphere on there that that is very leftist and 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 it th so that's one thing it's become it, it, it's it's a very political space let's put it that way um and also it's it's very um and when i say it i'm talking to this community of people on twitter who are interested in ufos who call themselves ufo twitter and it's very conforming it conforms for example um and before I talk about the conforming, it's it there's a there's a very there's a new age spin that's always present. And it's very conforming in the sense that it's like waiting eagerly for the government to give them, you know, a document dump. When's the document dump coming? And waiting, waiting for whatever crumbs the government's gonna give them, and 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 repeating this term that I absolutely hate. And I was talking to you and Dave Hodges about it I, last night, I think. I, I absolutely deplore the term UAP, the acronym UAP, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. I deplore it. Why? Because it's a term that the government gave us. It's the one they want us to use. I don't want to talk about your unidentified aerial phenomenon. I don't want to talk about the UFO phenomenon that you've covered up and obfuscated for decades, that phenomenon. Yep. The one in which you've retrieved alien tech, crashed alien technology. The one in which you've allowed millions of Americans to be abducted knowingly. You knew that they were being abducted for decades and said nothing. That one, that's the one I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about unidentified aerial phenomena. Trying to change the terminology 
uh, to cause people to, to view it as if it's a new phenomenon. And it's, it's this mysterious thing that we don't really understand yet. Uh, that makes me angry. I, yeah, we, I, because I know, I know the propaganda. We it's have propaganda. Plenty of understanding. We have plenty of understanding for it. You it's and propaganda. Are, and people you and I are on and, the same wavelength. There. And, and UFO Twitter it, it swallowed it hook, line, and sinker. 1947 to 1944, Blue Book. 1947 to 48 time frame. You have the crash in Roswell. Then you have, you know, what, over 1,500 different exposures around America to UFOs, not UAPs, which is a pet peeve of yours, UFOs. And from anywhere from actual military pilots and more especially from commercial airline pilots who were experiencing these airships in the sky and the entire time Heineck and others are doing this investigation for blue book for the department of, of defense for the air force they were covering up threatening threatening uh possibly one person was murdered who was a witness to this and then there were other events that were happening and the dni was involved cia was involved and yeah, the Air Force was involved. And during all this time, guess what you also have going on? MK Ultra, Mockingbird. A lot of things happened at the same time. And right. then in 1990, designed, designed, a lot of it specifically designed to obfuscate yes. the UFO phenomenon because it's not about lights in the sky. It's not about, oh, I saw an orb. It's about the technology and the entities who made it. It's it's about what we're what we're able to reverse engineer, what we're attempting to reverse engineer in our black budget projects. It's about what Richard Dolan coined as a breakaway civilization. Well, why in ninety? It's not about aerial phenomenon. Why That's a distraction. It's, those are the issues that we already know are going on deep underground military bases. And, and, you know, obviously UFO simply means unidentified flying object, but that's not what I'm trying to uh, articulate here. What I'm trying to say is that that old phenomena, the old UFO phenomena is where all the bodies are buried, not in the new UAP phenomenon. And let's try and figure out what these things are. And, you know, well, that, uh, that's, you know, that's the Nimitz from... incident, although that was really groundbreaking and, and astonishing, but the Nimitz incident, look at this Tic Tac, not a Tic Tac. It's obviously a saucer and it's flying through the atmosphere precisely the way that Bob Lazar said they fly. Like they turn on their side and they like slide through or tumble through space, basically. And and that is exactly the way that thing was flying. It's so like instead they got that's in front part of, the of narrative. UFO lore, not UAP newfangled. You know, let's have Congress investigate and try and figure out what this is. It's propaganda. Yeah. And the and UFO Twitter has absolutely been suckered into it Let me because they're conformant. It's very conformative. They're conformists. They're liberal leaning. And maybe there's a bunch of UFO Twitter people who are going to hate my guts now. And and uh no you you ask a good question let me let me let me, let me stop because i want to give you a breath okay why in 94 when the air force finally disclosed to the office of disclosure that there were no threats from 47 to 94 they discovered no threats there was like 1200 incidences that they were that were unexplainable everything else was explainable swamp glass being reflected from venus and drunk hillbillies in the woods okay but there's a lot of encounters very reputable credible encounters that happen that get glazed over because the u.s government comes and says hold on we're the government we're the experts we're going to investigate yeah, we're going to investigate so yeah this was a cover-up and everybody claps and goes, ooh, the government's going to investigate. Yes, it is a big deal that Congress is investigating. Why? Because it is a tacit admission that the phenomenon is real. That's all I need to know. I don't care about your investigation. Your investigation is going to draw whatever conclusions that the dumb state, the deep underground military base state, wants you to draw. I already and know that. So This is where the so, word threat comes in. Why threat now? 94, you didn't say it was a threat. For 30 years, it wasn't a threat. Yet, well, like for 30 said, years, it was an, all, it, it, they, they, the government feigned non-interest. We're not interested. It doesn't really interest us. 
That that that's what the government's line has been. Oh, we're not the Air Force. Oh, we're not really that interested in UFO phenomenon. They just sort of laughed it off. And now all of a sudden, yeah, it's real. And don't worry, we're investigating. And by the way, call them uh, call them UAPs now. It's like screw you. I'm gonna I'm gonna I want to create a T-shirt that says "Don't say UAP." You know, I mean, sort of piggybacking off the other political issue from Florida. Don't say shirt. UAP, I'm right? Make because that shirt for you. Don't say U A P. Say U F O. I want to talk about the old school phenomenon. I want to deal with the abductions. I want to deal with the reverse engineered technology. I want to deal with the bodies that have been recovered. I want to deal with the with with the agreements maybe that have been made in the talk, past. Can you talk about that, that agreement? Most people don't know about that. Well, that's a whole different subject, but that's well, kind of a whole different subject. I guess you're referring to the Grieta Treaty, the, yeah, the lore real, surrounding it. It's a, it's kind of a tall tale. Nobody knows if it's true or not. I happen to believe that it is, but I don't know. It's it's a story that revolves around Eisenhower's alleged meeting with a delegation of gray aliens at uh, I always forget the name of the Air Force Base. It's changed since it it happened. Um, uh, an Air Force Base in California and. Uh, in uh, Palm Springs, California. And Eisenhower allegedly went and, you know, he made up a false story, allegedly that he was at his dentist and instead he was at this base and a, a saucer or a couple of saucers landed and they interfaced with the greys uh, um, telepathically, I would assume. And, and, and an agreement was struck. And, and according to the agreement, uh, the greys would share some technology with us if we permitted them to abduct some of our citizens they promised that they wouldn't harm them and that they would give us a list of the abductees they would they would um keep us informed on what they're doing and who they're abducting and that suppose that was the greater treat so-called greater treaty um and uh and of course the good grays did not uphold their end of the bargain we did get technology but they didn't tell us who they were abducting and uh and we were left in the dark about that and the government and I and I actually believe that there's I would lean towards that being true, that story being true, credible. But again, I don't know for sure. And so the government has been was began to frantically try and figure out what the Greys were doing with the abductees. And we're starting to abduct people themselves. They were abducting the abductees. The military was that those are called my labs, military abductions and trying to force forcefully and very uh, with, with great hostility, try and and. Uh, uh, get the abductees to 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 tell them what the Greys were doing, and they in the military was implanting their own implants to try and you know track the people and 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 figure out what's happening on board those craft because you, they knew the people were being abducted. So that that's true. That part of the, the of the story is definitely true. And so that's a it's a very dark, sordid past when it comes to the military and the abduction phenomenon. That's why they don't want to have the conversation about UFOs because it conjures all of that. It, it conjures up all of that. And so that's why they've changed the terminology. Don't say UAP. And that phenomenon never left. No, of course not. It's, it's, it's accelerated. It's burgeoning. And uh, so, you know, anyway, that was my little vent on UFO Twitter. Not to say that I don't like, a lot of the people on UFO tours, there's a lot of great researchers and, and, and just uh, people who are fascinated by the phenomenon hanging out on there. But, but it, but it's just, it's just, there's, it's just so conformist and it just drives me nuts and very new agey. So what do you think um, of this new, this new congressional investigation task force, whatever the hell they want to call it now? I think this is going to be another blue book, another, another, Ability to cover. Yeah, I mean the cat's out of the bag. You, 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 uh, UFOs are real. They're technolo They're te they're they're technological hardware, um, and they're not manufactured by China or Russia. That's it. That was the disclosure that came out over the last couple of years. You can't. That cat's not going back in the bag. Okay, you can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. It's out. And so now all they can try and do is control the narrative and feign investigations and as i always say the people at the pentagon most of those people even the people who are investigating ufos 
They don't know anything. They don't have a need to know. They don't have access to the underground bases. They certainly don't have access to the black budget projects. They don't know. They know less than most ufologists worth their salt. I mean, they don't know anything. They 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 maybe have some reports, secret reports of encounters with UFOs by fighter pilots or whatever that the rest of us don't know about. So what? I mean, we've known that's been going on for decades. Um, so you know, don't make too much of it. Although it is, it is, it is. Let's say it is his. It is historic. What the what's happened over the last couple of years with uh, this this what I think was in kind of an unintentional disclosure that they're chasing the narrative that it leaked. They're trying to get a hold of it, trying to change the terminology. Um, it, it it is historic, and I don't think, by the way, necessarily that the government invented the term unidentified aerial phenomena. That was a part of the AA tip program. With Lou, Elizondo, with Lou Lou Elizondo, that was the the terminology being kicked around and used in in the background of that project. But once it came to light, that that became the manifest terminology, the newfangled term. You know, if you're if you're up to speed on the UFO stuff, then you're going to call it UAP. You're not going to call it UFO. You're going to call it UAP. Not me. I don't fall for the propaganda. So, anyway, again, as you can see, it uh, rattles my cage. Well, I I think I think there's precedence because the U.S. government has lied to us since we've had the ability to lie to us to us. You know, I mean, it's that is uh, that is the objective, and it is up to the individual investigator to remain object objectionably reasonable, searching for the facts in a non bipartisan area. Thinking as always, if you're going to present evidence. Consider yourself walking into a courtroom. You have the judge, the jury, and then you have another lawyer that you got to get in a battle with. And you got to convince the jury, which is you, the audience, right now. Are we telling the truth? Is this real? Or am I full of shit like all these other guys over here, like the government for 60 years that has lied to us, that has suppressed information? Like you said, it, I, 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 I sense your uh, I sense your want for the knowledge because many people have been harmed, irreparably yeah. damaged, and we well, knew so it the entire time. Right, the government did not protect. The Didn't objectives. warn anybody. Right, they 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 rather they they allowed them to be subjected to ridicule and and suffer quietly. And alone, the government did that. Now the government couldn't stop the abduction phenomenon; they were powerless to stop it. But they didn't even attempt to reach out to the abductees and help them. Quite the opposite. If the abductees would talk, like Carla Turner, for example, who was an abductee, her and her husband, and, and her husband was a, was a my lab abductee, was abducted by the military as well as being abducted by the Greys. So rather than try and protect them, the government was hostile. To its own citizens, you know, it's kind of dangerous to talk about that because that, you know, that's uh, not something that that the military ever wants to come to light. And when I say the military, remember, I'm not referring to, you know, the people working at the Pentagon. There's a handful of people who have access to the deep underground bases there, but not many. I'm talking about not the deep, deep state, the political machinery. No, no, no. I'm talking about the dumb state. The guys that are reverse engineering the technology and have been for decades. The guys that have worked at Groom Lake and run that operation. And the other ones. And the other ones. So, but anyway, I got to jump. But there's, so I guess sort of my, 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 my final thoughts here, if I could summarize our conversation, I would say two things. Don't get stuck in a feedback loop, whether it be giant feedback loop whether it be Nephilim feedback loop, whether it be Bigfoot feedback loop, whether it be supernaturalism feedback loop, or whether it be flat earth feedback loop, don't get stuck in a feedback loop and don't say UAP. Well, Tim, thanks for being on. Uh, I almost, almost able to, to catch you there at the end, but next time we do this, I want you to talk about men in black because I have a lot of information okay. on that. And I think that's a fun subject. Um, ladies and oh, it's gentlemen, always fun. it's always fun talking to you, Doug. Hey, man, it's it's a good time. Nobody gets to do this anymore. And we're going to be hanging out soon uh, in the flesh uh, on a secret project. We'll just oh, kind of yeah. tease it. We'll tease it like that. 
Yeah, that, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'm be able to uh, smoke some cigars again. With our buddy, L.A. Marsuli. Oh, yeah. Hey, listen, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're hearing, please like, share, and subscribe. Um, you know, it's not very often that we get Timothy out here and he can, you know, tell us what he knows. But I, I, I like many of you, um, I appreciate your work, Tim. I appreciate the honesty. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it is, it's a breath of fresh air to hear someone come out and actually care about this subject and not just gap us all off. So, you know, thanks for the conversation. Look forward to uh, seeing you soon. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. My name is Doug Thornton. This is Timothy Alberino. Stay frosty. Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum has said, you will own nothing and you will love it. And that's represented by what's going on across the planet today, where the economy of the world is in free fall. And nowhere is it more in evidence than with our own President Biden deliberately trying to sabotage what we have. Access to food, other resources. So Americans are in a unique position, really for the first time in our history, we're going to have to provide for ourselves or subject ourselves to the whim of the government. Do you really trust a government to feed you that left a thousand Americans behind enemy lines in Afghanistan? I don't think so. So where do you go? When you ask the question, who's the best prepper out there today? There's only one answer. Ready Made Resources and Robert Griswold. I call him King Prepper. And that's how a lot of people think of him. You have everything there you'd want from night vision to storable food, how to prepare cooking in emergency situations, books and videos on how to prepare alternative energy, communication, first aid that you wouldn't think of, natural antibiotics, you name it, Bob has it. Now, here's the good thing about Bob Griswold that no one else does but him. You don't have to buy anything to talk to him. If you're not sure where to start with your preparation, no obligation phone call directly to Bob. You can talk to him for free. Most people will charge you an arm and a leg for a half hour conversation. That's not Bob Griswold. He cares about helping America get prepared. Go to readymaderesources.com or you can call the number directly at 800-627-3809. Again, that contact information readymaderesources.com for the best prepping outfit in the country or call Bob Griswold directly 800-627-3809. Mountain State Survival covers your basis for your planning, prepping, evacuation, bugging in, or bugging out needs. They carry anything from educational material, camping supplies, emergency services supplies, food, first aid, survival kit and equipment, shooting gear, survival gear, tactical gear. They carry it all. They got it in stock. Give Mountain State Survival a ring. That's mountain-state-survival.com. Get this type of supplies while you still can. 304-517-6935. Mountain State Survival is one of the only places that I know of currently that is still carrying the delicious peak refuel meal that is ready to eat. It's personally the only thing that I eat at this point whenever I go out camping Whenever we have any type of emergency or disaster situation, that is the meal that I stick with. And you can find that at mountain-state-survival.com. Use Wrecker 5 for a 5% discount on your overall purchase. That's R-E-K-K-R 5. MountainStateSurvival.com. This show on the Heroes Nation app. Um, Heroes Nation is uh, the Heroes Nation app you can download in the App Store. Uh, it's up and coming. They got a lot of cool information on there. That is the main backup site so far for the American Vindictive Show. 
Uh, you'll, we'll also have some stuff on there that won't be on YouTube, it won't be on Rumble. It'll either be only on the gsradio.net, who is the uh, host of the American Vindicta Show, or it will only be an exclusive for Heroes Nation. And with that, I mean, you know, stuff that we're doing with the cave exploration, with the archaeological stuff. Uh, I'm going to start getting into a lot of paranormal talks and, you know, coming at that from my law enforcement and Christian perspective and be having guests on. And that will be exclusive to Heroes Nation. So make sure that you give them some love. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, everybody, for supporting me. God bless you and have a good day.